Over the past 10 years, we've been exploring a set of interests that lie at the intersection between architecture, nature, and technology. It's been said that the word nature <clears throat> is the most complex word in the human language. In our time, <clears throat> it has become even more complex because of the influence of, of technologies. For us, we find architecture in a difficult position caught somewhere between the problems of nature and the problems of technology. Our interest in nature has always been in its intensities, its intricacies, its beauty, and its most ugly. In other words, the sublime. We have never wanted to re reproduce any of nature's effects. We look to produce new effects with these new technologies, and in fact, we seek to be more intense, more intricate. The desire is to be uh, more nature than nature, to out-nature nature. David and I met at Columbia during a time of significant pedagogical and technological upheaval. We were in the first paperless studios, which meant we were also in the last studios in which the design was exclusively with ink and paper and physical models. We thought it was necessary then to rethink what architecture could mean and could be after this time. This is a photo of our office taken at night. It seems that most of our most thoughtful work happens at night in this office. Uh, in this photo, you can see some examples hanging on the wall and on the, the floor um, of some of our experiments in uh, digital produ production. And the most significant prominent feature in this photo is the large communal table in the, in the middle, which we have always designed our offices around the communal table. All of the people that have ever worked with us up to this point have worked with us at this communal table where we share and exchange ideas. The person who I've spent the most time with at this table, I'd like to introduce to you, is David Rue, my partner. Thank you. So it was great to be introduced uh, by my boss of the past 10 years. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so uh, what I will do is go over a set of ideas and interests that is uh, probably uh, the most important project we've done in the past 10 years is the development of our discourse and, and ideas. And then uh, I'll move to a couple of uh, speculative projects and then our, the sequence of our digital fabrication experiments over the past seven years approximately. So I start with this image uh, and the label, the ecological and the computational, because this is the condition within which we've located our work. Uh, it's uh, a slide, uh, it's an image of two different worlds. One, which is a world we first saw in the late 60s when we first sent uh, vehicles into space. And many ecologists point to that as uh, a, a seminal moment when uh, the problem of ecology became uh, urgent when we first saw how small this planet was. Uh, the second world we see uh, is actually a mapping of the internet and it's another world that we've seen only recently in the past three years and it has a form and organization that was utterly surprising and this organization is arboreal and astonishing. So it's in at the space between these two worlds where we, we begin to think about uh, what architecture is. And as Carol mentioned, our projects are found at the intersection of architecture and nature and technology. So what is uh, the computer? A computer is essentially a pattern. It's a highly artificial patterning of what? It's a patterning of the stuff. And in that patterning, we have a uh, what we now know as the digital era. This is a photograph uh, taken in the late 30s, and this is a basement room uh, at the Pentagon. And this was before uh, the actual mechanized computers were first built, uh, as they were uh, beginning initial calculations for uh, the Manhattan Project most of the calculations were actually being uh, taking place by hand, hand calculations. 
and primarily by women, because uh, most of the men were in the theater of war. So I wanted to show this image because uh, this is where the word computer comes from. Uh, these women in these basement rooms in the Pentagon were known as the computers. So it has a very strange history. So intellectually, uh, some have remarked that the computer itself and computation in general is a thousand-year-old dream in Western civilization. But more prosaically in our time, it starts with uh, something uh, that has this very peculiar kind of uh, gendered uh, uh, root where the word itself was attached to a very strange problem found in society because after all, they were trying to design the nuclear bomb. And then it migrated strangely into uh, this thing I have in front of me right now through which uh, we do our work. So later, uh, the very same function was mechanized and was it successful, uh, indeed it was, shockingly so. And more currently, uh, we see images like that. Uh, this is a DNA fingerprint of uh, the first cloned animal. Dolly was her name. And from insights such as that, we find uh, intersections, for example, in the art world. This is Eduardo Cac holding uh, what is his most famous uh, art project. Uh, this is Alba, the transgenic bunny, uh, who Eduardo subjected to gene therapy so that uh, when the lights are off, uh, Alba glows in the dark. We also see uh, recent uh, innovations, uh, if you could call it that, or discoveries in mathematics. This is actually a graphing of a very simple equation, and it is uh, the first uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, model of a fractal. So what intrigues me about this quite a bit is the results of uh, technological innovation are beginning to broach upon uh, what we uh, maybe uh, intuitively might refer to as being in relationship to nature and natural systems. But again, this is just a resemblance and probably nothing more than a metaphor of mathematics for what we think of as nature. Here's the equation itself, quite simple. And this uh, is a kind of fly through through a model uh, based on that equation that I just previously showed. And I'll let it play a little bit because it's stuff like that that uh, astonished us quite a bit. That Already in, in culture and in the sciences, this intersection already appeared to be taking place. Though in architecture itself, it had been less explicitly stated. And as Carol mentioned, we uh, graduated uh, from the MR program at Columbia in a time of great technological upheaval where just how the architect works uh, uh, changed dramatically. So for us, uh, it seemed uh, like a necessary thing for us uh, to really slow, slow down a little bit and begin to try and think through what are the problems facing us in the 21st century. I wanted to show this one uh, in particular because uh, I, I often thought uh, the mathematical representations were a little bit too geeky to ever be cultural, uh, but recently, uh, these kinds of images that are coming to us from the sciences are becoming dangerously close uh, to home. And this one in particular, you see uh, what begins to resemble a kind of Baroque, self-similar repetition. But, uh, and none of this was really intended. Uh, the person who discovered this was merely trying to uh, advance uh, the kind of uh, intellectual project of uh, the fractal and what defines it and, and to his surprise, uh, discovered some of these conditions. So we see uh, great technological innovations like solar panels that allowed us to do something so spectacular as go into space. But yet when these technologies uh, come down to us uh, in architectural practice, we seem to be caught in between problems. So images like this uh, disturb us quite a bit. 
Uh, for example, uh, what we see in this is uh, a kind of problem where architecture is caught between a, a cultural necessity and a technological one. And then the result is just an, a very uncomfortable uh, pragmatics. So with this, uh, uh, moving on to uh, our projects, uh, these were our, our concerns uh, going into uh, our design work. And much of this uh, uh, is really retroactive because it's something uh, that we've been asking ourselves constantly after the completion of each project. What was our work really about? So uh, I think 10 years ago when we started this, we never would have been able to express it uh, as we have just now. Uh, however, the intuition that was driving it uh, is very much, uh, was very much in play uh, 10 years ago, and it's now only becoming much more explicit uh, in a way we, where we could actually talk about this. So, as Carol mentioned, uh, we, we quickly begin to, began to discover that uh, our work had to uh, consider uh, very upfront uh, what were the aesthetic conditions that we were interested in in nature? And this is something that uh, we were always drawn to. Uh, the outrageous efflorescence of color and form that we always see all around us. We live in a world of intense variety and variation. Uh, a kind of outrageous uh, uh, teeming uh, uh, soup of intensities. But yet, uh, architecture always seemed to be uh, the mechanism by which we contain it, or frame it, or organize it. Yeah, Carol discovered this photo, and it's one of my absolute favorite photos. Uh, so uh, we had a, a shift in strategy where after our early projects, we be began to try and evaluate how can we be more uh, definite about what could be uh, an architectural set of tactics for producing effects like this. And this was a very important photograph for us, a kind of discovery, because uh, this is a still image from the movie Metropolis. And you have the director in the middle with the old kind of analog bullhorn there, basically issuing uh, instructions for where the actors would have to be placed. And the kind of efflorescence of human figures here in the pool uh, seemed uh, to be uh, resonant with what we're thinking about when we're looking at images like this. But yet, uh, the architect in the middle is not going in and placing every figure in the exact same, in the exact pose that he had designed, but rather he is issuing a set of very simple commands. And then uh, there is something, uh, for lack of a better word, is then uh, emergent in the atmosphere that accrues around those instructions. And we are also seeing things from the art world that seem to have a very similar approach where the necessity was not to uh, articulate and design every single line, but there was a, a much more simple and direct approach to how certain things could be produced. Uh, this uh, was the moment at which we made our proposal for PS1. And uh, we want to explore a lot of these ideas, and here is where uh, the project became a little bit more interesting, culturally speaking, because to this point, uh, we were uh, a bit nerdy in uh, dealing with very esoteric and rarefied, almost academic issues. Uh, so what we wanted to do was uh, for there to be a very accessible, like a uh, kind of basic understanding of what we were pr proposing. We essentially wanted to tie, uh, tie up uh, PS1 and bind it in this rope made out of banana fibers. And it's traditionally a project uh, made up out of small components because of uh, the very modest budget. So we wanted to uh, uh, do a, a very large uh, proposal and wanted to use a very modest material, cheap material, something that could be easily constructed, but something that nonetheless uh, uh, could resonate with uh, these concerns that I have just been speaking about. So what we went to was a kind of a grandma technique of uh, macrame. And yeah, and, and yeah, we laughed too when we actually came up with this because uh, uh, although what it signifies was something uh, much more low level, when we actually looked at it, it seemed incredible. And 
there was uh, something in the procedure of producing macrame that, uh, believe it or not, uh, seemed very much in line with what we were thinking of in terms of computation. So ultimately what we calculated, and this is uh, an important part of the story, a lot of this is stuff that we actually didn't say when we presented at MoMA. This is really more for the in crowd about uh, what we were, were really doing versus uh, what it meant, and I'll talk about that again in a second. But uh, we jumped through a lot of uh, very strange technical hoops to actually calculate this because it's formed the rope that's tied it became virtually impossible to predict exactly how much rope we needed. So we actually had to uh, engage some uh, fairly uh, uh, unusual uh, mathematical software uh, in topology to uh, more or less estimate how much rope we needed. And uh, at other lectures, uh, people have asked uh, afterwards why 3,757 knots? Uh, no reason. It's, uh, for us, uh, uh, what was important was the degree of intensity, not the exact number symbolizing anything in particular. Uh, so this is uh, some of the perspectives we showed. And we likened this to be a kind of hanging garden of knots. So uh, here we were very interested in a kind of arboreal aesthetic condition. Uh, the kind of uh, sense of beauty one would have when tending a garden versus making uh, a plan. Uh, this is our model. And yes, we did tie 3,757 knots. Uh, it took six people about two weeks. And from the outside, we were very interested in how the ropes would come over, supported by the concrete perimeter wall, and have the appearance of uh, the courtyard having been bound in rope. So we were very open to uh, associations, like everything from the nautical to the naughty. But uh, for us, uh, what was interesting to us was that uh, what it meant was actually open-ended, that we didn't first decide that we wanted a set of meanings and then figured out the appropriate representations of it, but rather we were dealing in a very low-level way with uh, just geometry, intensities, and form, materiality, and then uh, we were uh, really trying to tend the garden uh, in a very literal sense. So you could see how our earlier studies in fluid dynamics then uh, came into play. Again, this is uh, an image we didn't show uh, when we presented. It's a little bit too technical, I think. And a lot of this uh, came uh, at a moment when uh, we were beginning to think about uh, the 19th century notions of the sublime. Turner, in particular, and the steamboat. Uh, he, uh, it's been remarked that uh, Turner uh, had a tremendous anxiety in that time period about uh, the role of technology and our engagement of nature and the changing idea of what nature is relative to the industrialization that was taking place. So here in the storm, you have the steamboat, uh, one of uh, the emblem emblematic machines of the 19th century. And it's fascinating how in the painterly composition, you have this kind of uh, dissolution of this technology into the atmosphere. Uh, the reason why uh, it's juxtaposed here with the Faraday diagram is because uh, he uh, was uh, very good friends with Michael Faraday, who had discovered the electromagnetism diagram. And this relationship between uh, stories of how he carefully traced these electromagnetic diagrams to develop uh, a transition in his ability to make a brush stroke to produce a very particular kind of atmosphere seemed very much the kind of thing we were doing in our office, where we were looking at the technology, looking at new ways to draw, looking at the sciences, but never uh, actually interested at all in making architecture more scientific. For us, that's uh, uh, antithetical to ultimately what we're trying to do. We're ultimately trying to produce new ways of being in the world, and new sensations, and a new engagement with space, aesthetics, form, et cetera, and never really about the methodologies. So therefore, we usually keep a lot of these investigations going on behind the scenes really to ourselves because ultimately we don't think it's, uh, it should be necessary for people 
to know all that in order to like the work. It, you either do or you don't. Uh, yeah. So uh, these were some of the books we were looking at, everything from the Encyclopedia of Knots and Fancy Rope Work from the early 20th century to con contemporary mathematic journals and topology. Uh, this was a, this was a little screen uh, capture of the software we're using to calculate the rope length. This is uh, topological software used by mathematicians. And ultimately, uh, uh, the material itself is uh, truly material. It's quite heavy. Yeah. And, uh, we, uh, and, and this is something that uh, really uh, is an idea we haven't picked back up. But uh, coming out of this was a very particular idea of how something might be built differently. Because we didn't want to uh, essentially produce uh, a drawing where the workers would then have to figure out the placement of every single knot in order to reproduce a scaled up form. But rather, what we wanted to do was approach it very much uh, according to the logics of uh, the computed macro made. That is, we were interested primarily in the inputs and the outputs of the rope, and a set of simple instructions, almost like a music notation. And all, the, all you would have to do is learn how to tie four different kinds of knots, and then follow the music notation. And we had a scheme of breaking down this garden into kind of an idea of states and counties in order to manage uh, uh, the distribution of the whole thing so we could break it down into separate problems. And these are just slides of uh, the different states and counties we have. Which uh, brings us to the last project here. Uh, so I, I briefly mentioned uh, a kind of brewing interest throughout all of this uh, in, in between uh, these very esoteric interests in form and geometry and technology, and, but ultimately uh, in relationship to what it potentially means uh, to the person that is engaging it. And uh, what we uh, started looking at was uh, uh, Rorschach uh, uh, images. These were our, our own uh, Rorschachs that we were constructing. And what intrigued us about this was uh, it's a very complex image. Uh, if a psychological log test consisted in trying to determine what the person was bringing to, to the page, you would expect that it would be a blank page, a blank screen upon which you could project uh, what you wanted to see. However, that's not the case. Uh, the thing that is best for enabling a projection of meaning is actually something very complex, something very intricate, something with color, something with form. And that struck us as something quite, quite odd and quite interesting. And there's uh, Mr. Rorschach himself. Uh, the Rorschach's uh, ink blots actually comes from uh, what was a kind of children's game uh, called uh, klexography, where at a party people would make random ink stains, and whoever could come up with uh, the most magnificent story or poem that could go with the, the random image would basically win the game. And it's interesting how in the 20th century this then evolved into a kind of psychological profiling. And and it seemed to intersect quite a bit with uh, the art of the 20th century, where the problem of meaning and the problem of technique uh, reached a, a kind of point of crisis, but also in relationship to a more democratic uh, society where meaning would then have to be uh, enabled throughout the society. So we have to acknowledge diversity and difference of opinion, difference of meaning. So uh, this became the kind of basis for uh, uh, these final uh, bits of digital fabrication experiments that we conducted, where we were essentially uh, producing uh, what you might call uh, random patterns, but they weren't exactly random. Uh, we prefer to uh, call it painterly now ourselves, but uh, perhaps we haven't found the perfect language yet. And it incorporates uh, something that really is in between the analog and the digital, because we were literally painting 
with ink, but at the same time, uh, putting it in relationship to some very esoteric digitizing techniques as well to produce a drawing such as this, which then uh, resulted in a, a, a modeling procedure where we found ourselves uh, chasing the rendering uh, quite a bit because uh, before we knew exactly uh, what we were going to build and how we would build it, we were absolutely sure that the images that we were producing was what we wanted. And then it became a very strange condition of simulating a, this kind of virtual condition with materials, with real materials. So almost a kind of reversal. And this is the actual piece that we produced. Uh, this is actually a 600 pound piece uh, in ultra high density uh, ren shaped foam. And uh, it was quite a challenge to actually uh, find a fabricator willing to take this on. Uh, here are the milling paths, uh, which in and of itself uh, we found to be incredibly beautiful. Uh, this is a photograph of the shop. Uh, uh, incidentally, uh, uh, there was a blackout in the middle of the milling, so there is this very strange line, uh, which you have to see with the magnifying glass, but it's a very strange kind of index of the fact that it was built physically through a process, and it happened uh, right in the middle of uh, the production of this. Uh, the fabrication shop was uh, in Ohio, and they normally uh, produce parts for NASA. And uh, uh, when we're shopping our geometry around, most of them basically had a heart attack and s essentially said, get out of here, you nut. Uh, we we get, brought them a file consisting of uh, over six million one degree patches. And, and uh, basically, uh, most of them told us it was impossible. Uh, but uh, we finally did find a fabricator that uh, took it on as a challenge and wanted to go for it. Uh, at the opening, uh, this was uh, placed in a gallery. It, it was very interesting uh, for us. Uh, all the different comments people were making about uh, what they thought it meant. Everything from, oh, you're producing, uh, you're representing a white flower symbolizing death uh, to, oh, it's a trilobite. And, and uh, normally that would be quite horrifying to see such a range, but that was exactly what we wanted. We wanted something that could have an intense range of uh, representation, uh, none of which was uh, really anything that we necessarily wanted to produce. And it uh, ties us uh, uh, really retroactively to other traditions, uh, again, to the Art Nouveau, but particularly to Louis Sullivan where we begin to understand uh, a, a kind of, it's almost like we found a friend uh, like from long ago where a lot of these ideas are really not in the past, but a set of ideas that have always been there seemingly in architecture that are still very much alive for us as we design. And when we open up treatises such as uh, Louis Sullivan's uh, System of Architectural Ornament, you see uh, a description of a procedure, I don't know if you could really see it, the geometry on top is nearly identical to uh, some of uh, the assumptions being made on the 3D software that we're using right now. And it's ties to, for example, uh, experiments by Frank Lloyd Wright to have a kind of modular ornamentation, these, this idea of textiles. It's very strange location in what it represents so that it can represent everything from a Mayan temple to a perfect set for a sci-fi movie. And these are uh, probably uh, the most exotic technologies we've used to this point. Uh, as part of this project, we were collaborating with EOS, which is a Munich-based uh, 3D printing company. Uh, they actually make the machines. And uh, what makes them novel is uh, they make probably the highest end machines in the world today. And the idea is their 3D printers are not printing models, but the actual finished parts. So they print in all kinds of metals and uh, conduct in incredible tests, uh, stressing uh, their objects. They're uh, incredibly expensive, so its only applications right now is primarily in uh, medical, uh, uh, 3D printing new elbow joints and things like that. But uh, they were interested in 
uh, pl uh, playing with us a little bit and because they do realize the only thing that's going to make their technology more mainstream is more volume. So unless uh, there are applications that could call for more of these mach machines, it will remain incredibly expensive. So our proposal to them was to simply uh, see if we could come up with some interesting architectural applications of their machines. So it was a fantastic opportunity for us. So uh, these pieces uh, we call uh, just uh, 3D printed bricks. And the material is a composite aluminum nylon material, which is sintered with a metal and essentially like a hunk of metal. Uh, and it was a very strange process because we were working on our computer uh, back here in New York and then FTPing the file to Munich. And then th three to four days later, we get a FedEx package with uh, the metal version of what we had just modeled. So it raises some fascinating questions, I think, about uh, how we might possibly work. And it's hard to know in the near future or in the distant future. It's hard to tell at times. And this is uh, EOS, some of the materials that they could print in. It's incredible, like a cobalt and stainless steel. To be able to print in stainless steel is just an incredible idea. And they're uh, in search of applications. So you see some of the medical applications. There's even been an attempt to produce a handbag that's 3D printed. 